admit this is one of my favorite topics in the whole class because I really like writing systems. And in this video, we're going to look at different types of writing systems for the languages of the world. In English, we use an alphabet with consonants and vowels. There's languages like Arabic and Hebrew that use consonantal alphabets, where they have mostly consonants and very few vowels. There are featural alphabets like Korean, where the shape of the letters resembles the shape of your tongue in your mouth. There's syllabic alphabets or abugidas, where the consonant is the primary symbol and the vowel is the secondary symbol. There's syllabaries, like those for Cherokee and Japanese, where one symbol represents both a consonant and a vowel at the same time. And there's local graphic systems, like those for Egyptian and Chinese, where a drawing represents a word. You know an alphabet. You use an alphabet every day. Alphabets have consonants, vowels. Sometimes they have diacritics to indicate um, some of the stress, like we do in Spanish, for example. There's many uh, different alphabets in the world. This is the one for Greek, for Georgian. Uh, the Roman alphabet, the one we use for English and Spanish, is very unusual in that it has an anomaly. It has uppercase letters, which are not very common. It's not common to have two versions of the same letter. And this happened because medieval scribes really liked to use these fancy big letters at the beginning of their paragraphs. And so these de decorative forms got mixed in with the regular letters, which were the lowercase. And lo and behold, we now have a system that has an alternation between the big ones and the small ones. And by the way, they're called uppercase because they were kept in the literal uppercase of printers' books of printing blocks. So alphabets use consonants and vowels. There are consonantal alphabets or abjads, which mostly or only use consonants. So for example, Vowels do exist in Arabic and Hebrew, and they can be used for special situations like reading religious texts where you need to get the pronunciation right. But in everyday life, if you're reading the newspaper or if you're writing an essay for college, you don't write the vowels. You write, for example, for the word language, lura in Arabic, l, ra, and then something that means short a, lura. So one vowel. Um, in Hebrew, safach, no vowels. S, F, H, and you, you insert the vowels from your knowledge of the language. If you already speak Arabic or Hebrew, you know that there's a word that has S, F, H, so it's probably Safah language. Can you try to read this uh, sentence in English that uses only consonants? Yeah, you can still read English without vowels. It, yeah, we can do it too. So we have alphabets uh, with consonants and vowels and, fa and uh, alphabets with mostly consonants. Korean uses a very interesting alphabet. First of all, because it's not linear. It's not one symbol after the other. What comes one after the other is the syllables. The syllables have to be arranged in squares. So you have the onset, the nucleus, and the coda, and they can only come in a limited number of arrangements. But more importantly, the, this was a system that was deliberately invented by a king called Sejong in the 1400s. And he, he made the shapes of the letters according to the shape your tongue makes when you are pronouncing the letter. For example, the first one is a K. And it is supposed to mean like, you know, the little corner that your tongue has when it touches the velum in the, uh, in the back. This one is the N, the alveolar N, and it's because your tongue goes to the alveolar region and it's like raised. Mm. This triangle is for the S and the T's, and it's for the S, I'm sorry, and it's meant to um, symbolize the dental form, like your, te like your tongue going up to your teeth. This square is for the bilabial M, and it's supposed to be the shape of your lips as they're released, M. Here. This one is for glottal sounds like the H, and it's like the back and the tube of your throat. So in theory, the creator of the system was inspired by the shape of your tongue as it does the features, which is very unique. Our letters in English don't do this. Our letters A and B were, if you remember from last video, the picture of an ox and the picture of a house that have undergone a lot of transformation. They don't have anything to do with what our tongue is doing when we say A and B. Right. 
Abu Gidas are mostly used in the writing systems of India and Southeast Asia. There, the consonant is the primary symbol. So we have something like ba, this consonant here. The vowel is sort of a secondary attachment or diacritic. B, bu, bur, bl. This is the one, this is the symbol for ka. Ka, ki, ki, ku, ku, ker, and so forth. So you can see that the k form remains, but then there's different diacritics that you add to, add, to indicate the different vowels. In an abugida, again, the consonant is the primary symbol and the vowels are sort of secondary. This is the K sound for many other writing systems of India, and this is the E, the short E. So this is ki, 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 and you can see how always the consonant is the primary shape and then the vowel is sort of like an attachment to it. Syllabaries are really cool. They represent the whole of the syllable. So Japanese, for example, has about 45 possible syllables and they all have a different symbol. Na, ni, nu, ne, no. And you can see that in these five symbols, they don't have anything in common that we could call N. The N is implicit in all of them, as, is, as are their vowels. The system on the left is Cherokee. Cherokee is a writing system from the Cherokee community in North America. And it is extremely interesting because it's one of two writing systems from the Americas. One is the Maya hieroglyphs and the other one is Cherokee. Cherokee was invented by a person called Sequoia in the 1810s and 20s. He saw how um, the U.S. had all these treaties on paper and he, th he, he wanted to, you know, have that the kind of power that the U.S. displayed to be able to make claims based on paper because they seem to be so important to the U.S. culture. And so he uh, designed a writing system for Cherokee with the aid of his daughter, who was the one who had the better hearing and helped him um, distinguish between the different syllables of Cherokee. He designed a syllabary. So as you can see, for example, in the symbol for e, ge, ke, and le, they, there's nothing in common to these that, it, that could be called an e. It's just that the whole symbol is pronounced he, this whole symbol is pronounced le. And it's a writing system that the Cherokee community uses to this day and is extremely proud of. You can type it on your computer, on your cell phone, on Google, and there's a Wikipedia using these characters for Cherokee. Logographic systems, the, the mother of them all. These include Chinese characters like we see here. So these are different uh, styles for writing characters over time, and yes, in the beginning, most of the characters were hieroglyphs, were drawings. So you can see how the moon was sort of like a moon-like object and rain is like water falling down. And over time, and with um, you know, scribes adding their own styles, they became the characters that we have nowadays. In modern Chinese, only about 10% of the characters are real hieroglyphs. 90% are combinations of sound and meanings. But there's a few that are still just drawings. These uh, started as drawings to represent words and eventually became characters to represent words. All of these systems have this conflict in them. There's too many symbols. Um, Chinese and Japanese use thousands. To read Japanese, you read about 2,000, you need maybe 2,000 symbols. In Egyptian, there's about 800, and there's hundreds of symbols in Mayan as well. So they all develop ways to cope with this. Many of them are mixed system, where words could be written in more than one way to help you figure out the pronunciation. For example, this was the word jaguar in uh, classical Maya, balam. You could write it with a little syllable in front of it to help you remember that this is the word balam. So this is, this is not pronounced babalam, this is pronounced balam. The symbol here is just meant to help you remember. You can use other combinations. You can use the ba at the beginning and the ma at the end to remind you that this is pronounced balam. Or you can just write it with the syllables balam, balam. So all of these would be pronounced the same. They're just different ways for the scribe to remember how to pronounce jaguar. Egyptian worked in exactly the same way. Finally, not all uh, writing systems go in the same directions. Some systems go right to left like the ones for Hebrew and Arabic. So the, they're written in this direction. 
So systems go from top to bottom. In Mongolian, you read like this. Some uh, There's a direction called Bustrophedon, where um, you take a look at this one. So let's start here on the right side, and then we go all the way to the end, and then boom, we hit the end of the line, and we start from left to right. We finish, and boom, we go from right to left. So Bustrophedon means that you begin in the same place where you ended in the last line. Uh, there's many runic systems that were Bustrophedon. Egyptian hieroglyphs had variable uh, direction. If you see all of these symbols with faces, like the cats and the birds and this guy here, they are all looking towards the left. So they're all looking towards the start of the line. So you must begin to read from here. In this one here, all of the symbols with faces are looking towards the right. So the right is the correct point to start reading. These are some of the ways in which the, uh, the writing systems of the, work, of the world operate. They're all technologies meant to represent the, the writing systems. None of them are perfect. All of them have problems with writing prosody, for example, with, in, with making the difference between really and really. Uh, but they do a fairly good job of representing the sounds and reminding you of the sounds of the words in your language.